step into the dark and chilling world of two notorious serial killers as we delve deep into their twisted minds and heinous acts in Twisted Chronicles, unveiling the minds of William MacDonald and Colin Ireland. This gripping video takes you on a journey through the lives of William MacDonald and Colin Ireland, shedding light on the horrifying crimes they committed that shocked the world. William MacDonald, nicknamed The Mutilator, is an Australian serial killer from England, who was convicted of the murder of five people he stabbed and mutilated between 1961 and 1963. The man was sentenced to prison at life and died in 2015 in prison, at the age of 90. William MacDonald was born in Liverpool, England, on April 17, 1924 as Allen Ginsberg to a family of two other children. Very early, his parents noticed that this child is not ordinary. Alan is indeed used to taking long walks, alone, and runs away on many occasions. His mother also had to call the police several times to bring him back to the home. Taciturn, withdrawn, the child never seeks company among his peers and the psychiatrists will diagnose the young Grinbert as schizophrenic. In 1943, at the age of 19, Alan enlisted in the army and was transferred to the Fusiliers Corps in the county of Lancashire. There, he is raped by a corporal while he is in his company in an anti-aircraft shelter. His superior threatens him with death if he speaks. Traumatized at first sight by what has just happened to him, the young soldier Grinberg seems to change his mind to tell himself that he appreciated the experience. But being homosexual at that time meant having a life of misery and humiliation. The rape suffered, the corporal's contempt for him, will play an important role in the plot of events to come. In 1947, Alan Grinberg left the army where psychiatrists confirmed the diagnosis made by their colleague. The man is schizophrenic. His brother then has him locked up in a mental asylum in Scotland where the cells are freezing. Alan receives electric shock treatment there every day. After six months, his mother takes him out and brings him home. He then mixes with bar life and becomes an active homosexual, openly soliciting men in toilets and in public bars. His homosexuality makes life difficult for him and he goes from job to job because of the taunts and insults he cannot handle. Worried about his mental health, he consults a psychiatrist and tells him that he is plagued by visual and auditory hallucinations. On the practitioner's recommendation, he decides to spend the next three months in a mental institution, but nothing changes. Convinced by those around him that he was solely responsible for his condition, Alan Grinberg decided to flee England and emigrated to Canada in 1949, then six years later to Australia in 1955. He wanted to start a new life and to do so change of name. He will henceforth be called William MacDonald. Shortly after arriving in the Southern Land, he was charged with indecent assault for touching a detective's penis in a public toilet in Adelaide. He goes to court and is sentenced to two years probation. He moved to Ballarat, in the neighboring state of Victoria, and found work on a construction site. His colleagues make fun of him and his mannerisms and call him Poofter, equivalent to pedal in French. In retaliation, he buys a very sharp knife and slashes the tires of their bikes. Very quickly, and because of these taunts, he is forced to continually change jobs and move from one state to another. His rage also increases against his executioners as he goes along, accentuating a nascent paranoia. Indeed, he imagines that all the people he meets talk and make fun of him behind his back and that the army corporal who raped him insults them. In 1961, William MacDonald moved to Sydney to an East End facility. The murders began in Brisbane in 1961. MacDonald befriended a 55-year-old man, Amos Hurst, outside the Roma Street Transit Center. After a long drinking session in one of the local pubs, they returned to Hearst's flat where they consumed more alcohol. When Hearst became drunk, William began strangling him. Hearst was so intoxicated that he didn't understand what was happening and eventually started bleeding profusely. Blood flows from his mouth onto McDonald's hands who punches him in the face, finishing him off. The body was found five days later. McDonald reads the obituary notice in the newspaper where he first learns that the man would have died accidentally. The death will eventually be converted back to murder. His next victim is named Alfred Reginald Greenfield. 
his body was found naked and was the subject of more than 30 stab wounds. The police discovered that he was also mutilated since his genitals were severed. William McDonald met Alfred while he was sitting on a bench in Green Park which is opposite St. Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst. As with his previous victim, McDonald offers the man a drink with him and drags him to the nearby baths with the option of drinking more alcohol there. McDonald feels his urges assailing him and he struggles to restrain himself from killing Alfred on the spot. He must wait until the latter is sufficiently intoxicated so that he struggles less and makes the victim easier to kill. This is what happens a few tens of minutes later. He then takes him to a quiet corner and there stabs him 30 times. The ferocity of the first blow tears his artery. McDonald then pulls down his pants and underwear and slices off his penis and testicles, which he later throws into Sydney Harbour. The third victim follows very quickly. This is William Cobbin, 55, whom he meets at Moore Park. He puts on his plastic raincoat and takes his victim to the public toilets. As Cobbin sits, McDonald uppercuts him then stabs him in the neck, severing his jugular vein. Blood spatters the arms and hands of the murderer as well as the walls of the toilets. His victim dead, he pulls down his pants like the others and cuts off his genitals. Her body was found in a public restroom in Moore Park. On March 31, 1962, the murderer went hunting again in New South Wales and fell on Frank McLean. The day before, McDonald bought a knife from a sporting goods store in Sydney. He then leaves his hotel room in Darlinghurst and follows his victim who walks quietly down Burke Street, past the local police station. He catches up with him and strikes up a conversation with him and offers him a drink at a bar around the corner. Upon entering a dark area, McDonald stabs him in the face and then punches him, knocking him off balance. McLean escapes the assaults of his attacker thanks to the arrival of a family who passed not far from them and whose baby, confined in a stroller, begins to scream. The father of the family discovers McLean, mortally wounded, his face bloody. Accompanied by his wife and baby, the man goes to the police station in search of an agent. During this short time, McDonald, concealed, comes out of his hiding place to finish his victim lying on the ground. He pulls the barely alive body down the dark lane and stabs him again in the head, neck, throat, face, chest, stomach and abdomen before pulling down his pants and stabbing him. Cut off the genitals which he places in a plastic bag and then throws them away. The police arrive a few minutes later and can only note the death brought by multiple stab wounds. The inspectors put on the investigation then think they are dealing with a serial killer, possibly a deranged surgeon. The way the genitals were sliced would indicate that the person who performed this operation has years of surgical experience. McDonald, who works under the name of Alan Sward Brennan, sorting mail at the local post office, gets fired. He is tired of jumping from one job to another and decides to go into business. To do this, he buys a 560 pounds, $1,120, store on Burwood Road in Concord, where he plans to sell sandwiches and small goods while living upstairs. The store is also an agency for a dry cleaning company. He will actually only live there for a week after giving the security deposit. On the night of Saturday, June 6, 1962, William McDonald goes to a wine bar, the Wine Palace, which is on Pitt Street, Sydney, where he meets Patrick James Hackett, 42, a thief recently released from prison. He approaches him and offers him to come to his house to continue their alcoholic evening. After a while, Hackett eventually falls asleep and falls to the ground. McDonald then pulls out his knife and strikes him in the neck, piercing his skin through and through. Hackett wakes up from the pain inflicted and tries to protect himself by pushing the knife away with his other hand. McDonald manages to punch him in the heart, however, killing him instantly. Enraged, he strikes several more blows until he loses his breath. His victim's blood spills in fury not only on the floor but also on the walls. The dull knife, McDonald fails to cut the genitals of his victim. The impulse falling and the endorphin effect with it, he collapses and falls asleep. When he wakes up the next morning, he finds himself lying next to his victim, covered in his blood which has leaked through the cracks in the wood and spilled onto the counter of the store. 
McDonald gets up, cleans himself and goes to the hospital to treat the wound inflicted on him by his victim before he died, in the hand. To the doctor treating him, he says he cut himself in his shop. Returning home, he decides to get rid of the body and drags the corpse into the basement of the store. He takes off all her clothes leaving her with only her socks. Thinking that the police will come looking for him for this murder, he flees and goes to Brisbane. Three weeks later, neighbors at his store smell a foul odor coming from the basement and call the health services, who in turn notify the police. On November 20, 1962, officers discovered Hackett's decomposing body. They are unable to identify him, the victim being too disfigured. The autopsy will be performed in a hangar at the back of the hospital because of the putrefaction of the corpse. This will reveal that it is a man in his 40s, which makes the police think that it may be the owner of the store, Alan Edward Brennan, alias McDonald, missing for a week. A notice is published in the newspaper's obituary column and McDonald's former colleagues at the post office attend his funeral. The real McDonald, meanwhile, lives in Brisbane before settling in New Zealand, convinced in his paranoia that the police are on his trail. But it is his impulses above all that remind him. The urge to kill returns, stronger than ever and to do this, he returns to Sydney where he meets one of his former work colleagues, John McCarthy who was surprised to see him there when he had attended some time before. At his funeral. But I thought you were dead, he told her in the preamble. The two men go for a drink together. McCarthy asks him if that's not your body under the shop, then whose body is that? In response, McDonald shouts at him to leave him alone and runs away at full speed before reaching Melbourne. His colleague, appalled, immediately goes to the nearest police station where he tells them about his meeting. The officers at first do not believe him and accuse him of drinking too much. They order him to go home and sleep to cut. Sure of his fact, McCarthy returns the next day to see the police who give him the same answer. He then decides to go to the Daily Mirror and makes an appointment with the judicial journalist, Joe Morris, to whom he tells his story. The journalist believes it and immediately publishes, for the next day's release, an article which he entitles Affair of the Walking Corpse. This paper will force the police to react. Officers will then exhume the body from the grave. Fingerprints are taken and compared with the files. The police upon seeing the results face their mistake and realize that their victim is James Hackett. Detectives realize that the murderer is actually the owner of the store. The wounds and mutilations inflicted on the corpse lead them to believe that McDonald is also the mutilator, this serial killer who has eluded them so far. Wasting no time, a composite sketch was made and the image distributed to newspapers and venues in Sydney and surrounding provinces. Meanwhile. William McDonald is employed at the Melbourne Railways. In order not to be recognized, he dyed his hair and let his mustache grow. He lives in a boarding house where he calls himself Alan McDonald. Despite this, he is recognized by his colleagues who denounce him to management. She agrees with the police. McDonald has to come get his check for the week, the police will grab him then. And that's what happens. The agents fall on him handcuff him and take him to the station in custody. Very quickly, McDonald admits the murders, explaining that they are due to an irrepressible impulse of desire to kill. He tells the detectives the origin of his problems, the rape suffered in the army. His revenge, he would then have exercised on his victims. Rushed before the judge, he is accused of four first-degree murders. The trial date is set for September 1963. During the trial, William McDonald spoke very freely about his crimes and gave morbid details. He tells how he castrated his victims, then put their parts in a plastic bag and took them first to his home before throwing away what was left. However, he pleads not guilty to insanity and shows no remorse. He even adds that if he were free, he would continue to kill as often as his impulses dictated to him. The judge sentences him to life in prison. William McDonald leaves for Sydney Bay Correctional Centre where he is locked up in Long Bay Hospital, in a division of the prison. Very quickly he was transferred to a psychiatric hospital under the first name of Bill. 
Then in 1980, he was deemed sane enough to be returned to a traditional prison in Cessnock, a two-hour drive from Sydney. In December 2000, he refused to attend a hearing set to grant him a date when he would be eligible for parole. I have no desire to go live outside. I couldn't live there for five minutes. I'm too old and besides, I have everything I could want where I am. William MacDonald will die in prison on May 12, 2015, at the age of 90. He was the longest serving inmate in the New South Wales prison system. Colin Ireland was born on March 16, 1954 at West Hill Hospital in Dartford, Kent, to an unknown father who we only know was a press agent assistant. Her mother indeed refused to name the parent when she became pregnant at the age of 17 and gave birth a few months later. Although she did not want her son, she assumed the situation and to live, worked as an assistant in a newsstand. His salary was meager and it was increasingly difficult for him to provide for them. The maternal grandparents understood the situation and agreed to help their daughter who eventually went to live with them in the family home in Myrtle Road, Dad Ford. She and Colin will live there for five years, until 1959 when she decides to move to Birch Road Gravesend. The next six years will also be difficult, because the mother and the son will move nine times. Colin's mother, who was poorly qualified, only had access to part-time and low-paid jobs. Finally, they return to live once again with the grandparents, the only solution to offer her son a semblance of stable life. 1960, they move again. This time it will be for Sid Cup, in Kent and West Malling, in a homeless camp in Maidstone. After only three months there, Colin's mother decides to return to her parents. In 1961, she found a companion with whom she moved to Farnell Road, Dat Fort where they lived for three years. The situation stabilizes and Colin's mother marries Saker, an electrician who officially becomes Colin's stepfather. But this one does not have a stable job and the family is very unstable financially. In 1964, Colin Ireland was 10 when his parents were evicted from their Farnell Road home for non-payment of rent. Colin then goes back to live with his mother with the grandparents and as no man was allowed in their home, the stepfather left to live on his side. Later that year, her mother discovers that she is pregnant with her second child and despite a dire financial situation, she again decides to keep the child. She places Colin in a foster family in Wincott, Kent, and shortly after the birth, recovers her son and goes back to live with Saker who will leave them shortly after, leaving them penniless. In 1966, Colin is 12 years old and his mother meets a new man with whom she befriends and ends up marrying. This time, Colin refuses to take his name and decides to call himself after his mother, Ireland. The new family moved to Clyde Street, Kent, where they would stay for five years. Marriage seems to offer Colin stability for the first time, with his stepfather showing himself to be loving and providing a normal life for his wife. The child will attend during his childhood nearly six primary schools between five and ten years. Always labeled as the new kid on the block, and with his odd, lean, lanky build and bow-legged legs, he struggles to fit in and make friends. As a teenager, he increasingly skipped school, often with his mother's permission, and when he went to school, he was systematically snubbed, as he almost always arrived late. It is therefore difficult that he manages to make his way to high school. He is not a good sportsman, he is not very athletic, and therefore is never chosen to play in the school football or cricket teams. Colin Ireland has become a sad, lonely and withdrawn boy. His few friends are like him, immature. While in Sheerness he was approached four times by older men looking to have sex with him. The first of these encounters takes place when Colin Ireland is working at a fairground during his summer vacation. One of the traders offers to offer him a necklace for his mother in exchange for a sexual act. The second time takes place when Colin is 12 years old and is in the public toilets. A man in his 20s steps in and stands watching him. The third time takes place in a movie theater where the village optician offers him sexual favors. The fourth time, it is a man working in a second-hand store who tries to force his hand. Colin Ireland refuses as always the advances of this man. These four facts will upset him forever and fill him with an anger that will never go away and will turn into murders. 
It was at the age of 16, in 1970, that Colin Ireland committed his first crime. Devastated by what he has suffered, by his family life, his failing schooling, he flees to London. He needs money very quickly and starts stealing. His loot? Four pounds. The police fall on him, but the court is lenient and the county decides, rather than punishing him, to send him to Finchden Manor School in Kent. It is a so-called free expression school which only accepts boys with psychological problems and who are behind in school. But as for the other classes, Colin Ireland is manhandled by his comrades and in a gesture of frustration and revenge, he sets fire to the belongings of one of the boys who is bothering him. This is his first act of arson, but he would later admit to having had an interest in fire since childhood and having had many nightmares in which there was a fire. One of the teachers manages to put out the fire and Colin is expelled from school. Finch Den Manor will not, however, press charges against him. He then finds himself once again in London. Homeless and penniless, Colin resorts to surviving the robbery. At 17, he was arrested and sentenced to spend a few months in a remedial school in Hollisley Bay which not only provided therapy, but also offered vocational training. However, he struggles to stay put and gets arrested again. This time, the court sends him to serve his sentence in a real prison, in Rochester, then in Grindon. Released at the age of 18, Colin Ireland met his first girlfriend while in a mental state which he later described as confused and unhappy. For two years, he joined the Navy and became a cadet. This would be the only truly positive moment of his youth. He was 21 in December 1975, when he was found guilty of burglary, auto theft, and property damage. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison. He will serve 12 in London before being transferred to Lewis Prison. On his release in November 1976 Colin Ireland moved to Swindon where he met his second girlfriend, with whom he had his first sexual relationship. She is from West India, and a mother of four. They live together for a few months before they break up. In 1977 Colin was again sentenced to 18 months in prison for making threats, then an additional two years in 1980 for theft, then two months in 1981 for fraud, and another six months in 1985. Between stints in prison Colin, poorly rehabilitated, takes whatever he can as temporary work and will in turn be a volunteer firefighter, restaurant chef, homeless shelter volunteer, bouncer at bars and gay discotheques. It was in 1981, while he was chef in a third-rate restaurant that he met Virginia Zamet during a conference on survivalism. She is 36, he is 27 has a five-year-old daughter and is confined to a wheelchair after a car accident that paralyzed him at the age of 24. The couple married in 1982 and Colin Ireland was finally happy. The family moved into accommodation in Holloway. Colin's neighbors call him the gentle giant. Unfortunately, happiness and stability are brief and Colin soon returns to prison. When he leaves, he becomes more and more aggressive and the couple ends up divorcing in 1987 after Colin had an affair with another woman. In 1989 he met Janet Young, the owner of the Globe Pub in Buckfast, Devon. She has two children, aged 11 and 13, and lives above her pub. Within a week of meeting, Colin moves in with them and marries Janet four months later. He introduces his wife to his mother who lives in Margate and to do this, takes Janet's car, takes the opportunity to empty their joint bank account and flees, leaving everyone in front of the accomplished facts. In 1991, his second marriage having failed through his fault, he moved to South End on Sea in Essex, 60 kilometers from London, on the north side of the Thames estuary. He works in a homeless shelter while at times being homeless himself. In 1992, several people from the shelter began to complain about him and cornered, he ended up resigning. Colin becomes more and more embittered and begins to get fed up with his wandering life and his problems finding a steady job. He is 39 years old in 1993, and rabies is part of his life. He has so far committed rather minor offenses but decides on January 1st to change that, he will now be a serial killer. He is indeed fascinated by them and spends many hours studying their facts, meticulously. He knows the techniques of profiling aimed at locating a killer through his geographical profile, 
a radius of 7 kilometers, of where he lives. It is for this reason that Colin will choose London as his hunting ground, deliberately deceiving the police by moving away from his home in South End on Sea. His first package will take place at the Colhern Pub in Bromption Road which is located in West London. It is a place that is renowned for its ease of finding a one-night partner. Customers wear a handkerchief with a color code that tends to signal to singles their sexual preferences, which avoids misunderstandings. Colin Ireland began frequenting the pub on March 8, 1993. He posed as a top, that is to say a master SM, a dominant partner. His first victim will be a 45-year-old choreographer, Peter Walker. Peter is what is known as a dominated, a slave, a submissive partner who approaches Colin and takes him to his flat in Battersea. There, Peter Walker lets Colin gag him with condoms and tie him to the four-poster bed with rope thinking it's foreplay. But it will quickly become violent. Colin did come with his murder kit which contains a rope, a knife, a pair of gloves and a change of clothes. Once Peter was tied up and unable to defend himself, Colin Ireland then used a dog leash, a belt and his fists to administer violent blows to his victim before placing a plastic bag over his head and killing him by suffocation. He doesn't stop there and burns his pubic hair to see what it looks like. Colin, once his package is done, cleans the apartment of his traces. It is while searching the belongings of his victim that he discovers that Peter is HIV positive. This discovery annoys him so much that he stuffs a condom down the young man's throat and another one up his nostril. He also places two teddy bears in the 69 position on the bed close to the body and stays in the apartment until the early hours to avoid the neighbors. He then returns home to South End by public transport and throws his clothes, gloves and shoes out of a train window. Colin Ireland, who had locked up his victim's dogs in a room, made it known by an anonymous call to the newspaper The Sun where to find them in order to release them and that above all his victim was discovered. The police then think, given the clues they collect, that this is an SM game between two adults that has gone wrong and then turn to the gay community. But there she finds the door closed, no one talking, as the police have a bad reputation in the SM community, as a newly passed law has just made SM between consenting adults illegal. After a two-month break, Colin Ireland feels the urge to kill again and returns to the Colhern Pub on May 28, 1993 to search for his second victim. The man will be a 37-year-old librarian named Christopher Dunn who will let Colin know that he likes to be dominated. He invites her to his flat in Wheelstone. After watching an SM video together, Colin offers Kristoff to get ready and a few minutes later finds Dunn naked except for a studded belt and a harness. The modus operandi is pretty much the same as the previous murder. Colin Ireland makes Dunn lie face down on the bed and binds his feet and cuffs his hands. He then beats and tortures him, holding a flame close to Dunn's testicles before choking him to death by stuffing pieces of cloth into his mouth. This time, Colin decides to reimburse himself for the rope and other things, drinks in particular, incurred to perpetrate his murder. He is indeed unemployed and forces Christopher Dunn before killing him to give him the code of his bank card. As for the first time, after cleaning, he remains in the apartment for several hours. Along the way home, he gets rid of the gloves and shoes he has been wearing and goes to Dunn's bank to withdraw 200 pounds. Two days after the murder, a friend of Christopher finds out. We are on May 30, 1993. Once again the police will think that this is a sexual game between adults that has gone wrong and does not link the two murders to each other. Six days after this murder, Colin Ireland returns to Colhern to find his third victim there, on June 4, 1993. His choice is Perry Bradley III, 35, businessman from Texas, son of an American soldier. Member of Congress Colin accompanies Bradley to his Kensington apartment and quickly suggests foreplay, but Perry Bradley is reluctant because SM isn't really his thing. He still ends up giving in when Colin makes him understand that he needs it to get excited. So he ties Perry, face down on the bed, and places a noose around his neck. Hand on the rope, he demands that his victim give him the code of his credit card. Perry offers to accompany him to the bank to give him the money. Colin refuses and threatens him this time with a lighter. 
The man gives in and Colin kills him by strangling him then places a doll on his corpse. After carrying out the usual cleaning, Colin Ireland left the flat the next morning with £100 he found at his victim's house and then went to the bank to withdraw another £200. Once again, the police make no connection between the various murders, which begins to irritate Colin who seeks publicity and recognition as a serial killer. He then decides to kill again. It will be June 7, 1993. He returns to the bar and meets Andrew Collier, 33 years old. The man works as a guard in a secure neighborhood. The two men go to Collier's apartment in Dalston. Andrew lets himself be tied up and handcuffed and once again, Colin demands the code of his bank card. His victim refuses and he strangles her with the noose. While covering his tracks, Colin discovers that Andrew was HIV positive. Fury seizes him and he decides to burn parts of Collier's body and strangle his cat. He puts a condom on her sex, another in her mouth and one on the animal's tail and positions the cat so that its tail is level with Andrew's lips. Colin Ireland then seizes the mug in which he had been drinking, steals 70 pounds and leaves the next day at rush hour. Eventually, the police end up linking the murders of Peter Walker and Andrew Collier because of the similarities of the scenes and in particular the use of condoms. The investigators understand that they are dealing with a serial killer. Moreover, Colin Ireland calls them on June 12, 1993 to tell them that he has killed four men and that they must prevent him from killing again because he was going to commit a new murder. His fifth and last victim is the Maltese chef Emmanuel Spiteri, 41, who liked to dress in leather. It was on the night of June 12, 1993 that they met, still at Colhern, and then went to the victim's home, by train, to Catford. As soon as he arrives, Colin ties Spiteri to his bed, handcuffs him, puts a noose around his neck and asks him for his bank card code before strangling him. He then watches television until the next morning and, before leaving, tries to set the apartment on fire, hoping that the entire building will go up in flames. But the fire will go out by itself in Spiteri's room. The next day, Colin Ireland calls the police and lets them know they need to search for a body in South London and gives them the address. He also tells them that he has read a lot of books on serial killers and that to reach the serial killer classification made by the FBI, he must have five victims on the counter, which he has achieved. So he can stop. On June 15, 1993, the landlady of Spiteri's apartment discovered her tenant's body and called the police. The police decide to get hold of him and organize a media campaign with a press conference where Detective Superintendent Ken John reports that five homosexual men have been murdered and that the murders are linked together. The superintendent urges the gay community to be on the alert and to notify their friends when they are absent or leaving with a stranger. Ken John also makes it known that the murderer might have AIDS and that the possible motive for his murders would be revenge. On June 19, 1993, the police distributed leaflets during the Gay Pride Festival in London, which was attended by 50,000 people. On June 24, 1993, police released a description of a man seen with Emmanuel Spiteri on the train from Charing Cross to Heather Green the night of the murder. The description speaks of a white male, 30 to 40 years old, over 6 feet tall, clean-shaven, short dark brown hair, dirty stained teeth. A week later, on July 2, 1993, the police released a photo taken by a surveillance camera showing the face of the man who accompanied Spiteri to the station and ordered this man to report to the police for questioning. The day after the broadcast, the police received more than 40 calls, some of which indicated that they had met the man in question at the Colhern Bar. On July 19, 1993, Colin Ireland decides to go see his lawyer in Southern on Sea and confesses to him that he was with Spiteri the evening of his disappearance. He confirms that it is indeed him on the photo diffused in the press, but that he did not kill Spiteri and that this one was with another man in his apartment. This information gathered by the police and the fingerprints found at Andrew Collier's house will make it possible to find Ireland, to arrest him, and to charge him on July 21, 1993. Two days later, Colin Ireland is charged with the murder of Emmanuel Spiteri and sent to prison despite the fact that he continues to plead his innocence. Colin Ireland finally confesses on August 19, 1993 to the murder of the five men. 
Showing no emotion, he gives the police the detailed account of his murders. On August 20th, he was charged at the Old Bailey Court in London with the murders of Walker, Dunn, Bradley, Collier and Spiteri. He is sentenced to life imprisonment for each of the murders. In his confession, Collins states that he was not at any time under the influence of drugs or alcohol at the time of the murders, that he was not gay or bisexual, that he was not was never undressed or engaged in sexual activity with his victims, and that he never felt any sexual thrill in committing these murders, that he chose his victims among gay people because they were easy targets. According to him, it was extreme male deviance that had triggered his anger in his youth and which exacerbated his desire for murder against gay SM. Colin Ireland saw himself as an expurgator who exterminated vermin and aspired to be recognized as such. The judge who sentenced him said, to take one human life is a scandal, to take five is carnage. In my opinion, it is absolutely clear that you should never be set free. Colin Ireland locked up for life, will continue to kill, this time attacking a fellow prisoner in Wakefield, Yorkshire. According to some sources, he would have indeed strangled his cellmate, a child killer, but no charges have been brought against him. Two weeks after this murder, he was transferred to a maximum security prison at Whitemore Prison in Cambridgeshire where he will remain alone in his cell. Colin Ireland died in February 2012 at the age of 57. His death was attributed to pulmonary fibrosis. As we close the chapter on the lives of William MacDonald and Colin Ireland, we're left haunted by the stark reminder that darkness can lurk behind the most unassuming facades. The stories of these two serial killers serve as cautionary tales, urging us to remain vigilant and empathetic to those around us. Through understanding and addressing the complex factors that contribute to such atrocities, we can hope to prevent future tragedies. Thank you for joining us on this chilling exploration of the human psyche in scary facts.